All right, you guys, welcome to the first lecture of the next unit. So we're going to be talking about the biosphere. So now that we know all about biodiversity and all these different um, creatures of the world and organisms, we're going to talk about where those organisms and creatures live in the world. So what are we going to be talking about today? We are going to introduce ourselves to the biosphere. So what is a biosphere? Um, along with a little introduction to ecology. So we're going to continue with ecology um, throughout this unit. And then we're going to really dive into aquatic and terrestrial biomes. So those are the different regions of the world where there are different temperatures, different um, attributes and climates and things like that that um, create these different biomes. So we're going to talk about those today. So first, let's introduce ourselves to ecology. So we're really kind of this all um, is under the umbrella of ecology, which is the study of the interaction of organisms with their environment. So we learned about all of the biodiversity that comes with our organisms. Now we're going to learn about their environment and how they actually interact with their environment. So there's two very important factors that go into um, an organism's environment. And those factors are going to be either abiotic, meaning they're non-living. So we're going to go through those non-living factors. And then there are biotic factors, right? The living factors, which could be them or other organisms um, in their environment, right? And when we talk about the organism's niche, right, or environmental niche, where they live, where they hang out, um, it's going to include all of these biotic and abiotic factors in their environment or in their surroundings. So I have a great picture here of um, the elephant seals. And if any of you guys have ever gone and seen them, um, they're up in Ananuevo. And they have certain areas where they go for breeding, right? So there's these uh, very important factors that they look for um, so that they can feel safe and um, breed um, once a year. So they usually come um, around the early of the year, so January kind of through um, March. If you ever want to go check them out, it's, they're very fun to watch. I know they just look like uh, large sausages laying on the beach, but um, the males uh, definitely have a lot of interaction. They do male and ma male to male competition and things like that. So um, they're very fun to watch. So let's just review a little bit from, I think, our very first lecture on the levels of organization. So when we talk about a population, we're just talking about a group of individuals in the same species that are living in a particular um, area of the world, in a particular geographic region. And then when you talk about a community, that's an assemblage of all the populations of organisms that are living close enough together for potential interaction. So that means that they're not of maybe the same species, so there could be other organisms in the community, right? And then if you talk about an ecosystem, now you're taking the environment into consideration. So now this is where we're talking about both those non-living and living components. So abiotic and biotic components of the environment. So how do those organisms interact with their environment? Why is the environment important for those organisms um, and why do they live there, right? And then the biosphere is the biggest, right? So this is all that is inhabited by life. So we're really talking about our whole entire world, right? So if we go through our pictures through the bottom, right? So we may have a population of sea lions, and then we could have a community of sea lions, and then there could be birds, there could be fish, there could be things like that that are in that um, community that have some potential of interaction, right? So of all these organisms. And then we have the ecosystem, right? So where these sea lions live, then you have to take into account, you know, the sea kelp and the fish and the ocean floor and the water and just everything that's non-living and living into account for their ecosystem. 
And then the biosphere is our world, right? So very big picture um, biosphere, right? So you could equate the biosphere with the earth, essentially, right? So that's big. So we went small to big, but you could go the opposite way as well. So we're gonna talk a bit about um, our ecosystems. So what's the big picture, right? Why do people study ecology? Well, ecology really provides a deep insight into environmental problems. So you're, if you're watching how organisms interact with their environment, you can tell if things are going wrong, right? So a classic example of this is DDT, which is an insecticide that was heavily used on crops back in like the 40s to the 60s. And this DDT would essentially get into uh, the soil and into the animals and it would magnify through the food chain. And so essentially birds of prey were very negatively impacted because they would eat these fish that had large amounts of DDT uh, in them. So it'd concentrate um, more and more as you go up the food chain. So it'd be in the water, the water would get into the plankton, and the plankton would then get into the smaller fish and so on into the bigger fish. And then the birds of prey were very, very negatively affected. So including, you know, our hawks and um, owls and things like that, but also the pelican uh, population really took a hit as well. I even remember back when I was a kid, there weren't that many pelicans, and now there are um, a ton of pelicans. You see them every time you go to the beach, really. And so um, they made their shells super soft. So the DDT uh, made the shells of their eggs super soft so that uh, they weren't able to bear any young. So that really uh, negatively impacted their populations. And so they saw this, right, as they were studying ecology and these populations and things like that, and they realized what was happening. And so they actually banned the use of DDT um, in the early 70s. So now a lot of these <clears throat> populations are recovering um, from the DDT. So we said that these ecosystems rely on biotic and abiotic factors. So the biotic factors are fairly straightforward. Those are all the living um, organisms that are in that environment. But what about those abiotic factors? And so we're gonna talk about those. So our first important abiotic factor is an energy source, right? So where do the living organisms get their energy from? Well, if you're talking about producers, such as plants, they rely on the sunlight for energy, right? And often sunlight can be a limiting factor. So if you're in a jungle, say, you know, these plants and trees are going to fight for uh, sunlight, okay? Whereas if you're a consumer, you can you are relying on the producers for food. So you're maybe indirectly affected by solar energy. Okay, so solar energy, sunlight is very important for not only plants, but also animals as well. So our second abiotic factor is temperature, right? So temperature has a very big influence on our metabolism. Right? So our metabolism is all the functions of our body, all of our cellular processes and things like that, the producing our proteins that we talked about. So the cells and all of those interactions and chemical reactions that they undergo in the body, all of them together is considered our metabolism. Okay, And if you have too extreme of a temperature, if it's too cold or too hot, we can't maintain our normal metabolism. Okay, And so we do see organisms that have adapted to allow them to live in these extreme environments. So of course, most of us like to have a very um, temperate environment, which is a, you know, very average temperature, so we don't get too extreme. But we do see 
things like that cyanobacteria that lives in 180 to five degree temperature uh, in Yellowstone. So that's just crazy, right? And then you see quite a few organisms and animals that have adapted to very cold environments, such as the snowy owl, for example, right? So definitely we have a lot of animals and organisms that have adapted, right? But in general, right, we don't have um, a huge fluctuation in temperature um, when we're talking about our, our biomes, which we'll go through those biomes, right? Because we don't want the temperature to get too extreme or else our body won't be able to function. So our third abiotic factor and a very important one as well is water, right? So how does that affect our life, right? Well, if we're talking about aquatic life, uh, tonicity is really what we're worried about in terms of what type of life or aquatic life lives in those areas. So tonicity, remember, is um, the solute concentration of the water. So if you have a higher solute concentration, you're more like a salt water, right? And so their cells have to accommodate uh, for that um, higher salt level and they're gonna, their cells are gonna try to lose water, right? So, and then vice versa, if you're in fresh water, your cells are um, have a higher salt content than the fresh water outside. So then your uh, the water is going to want to rush into you or into your cells, and that would be bad as well. So again, the aquatic life has adapted one way or the other, uh, depending on that tonicity and that solute concentration in the water. And you can't put one into the other normally, right? So you can't really take a saltwater fish and put it in fresh water and vice versa. There are some fish that can go between um, salt and fresh water and they've just adapted to their environment to be able to do that, but in general, right? So <clears throat> water has a great influence on aquatic life but also on terrestrial life too, right? So rainfall really determines the type of terrestrial biome. So the more rainwater you get, right? You're more of a rainforest. The less you get, you're more of a desert. So we'll talk about those different biomes and the water levels or the rainfall levels in those different biomes. So we do have a few more abiotic factors that we may not think about or may not be as obvious um, as our, um, you know, energy source, water and temperature, but we do have inorganic nutrients. So we're really talking about um, soil you know, what the soil structure, the soil content is, it's because nitrogen and phosphorus are very important factors um, in the photosynthetic organism, so in plants, but also um, in uh, for us as well. So the nitrogen cycle is very important and we all need nitrogen to survive. And so we talked about some of those um, organisms that can fix nitrogen, meaning it uh, turns it into a compound that we can um, utilize, right? So nitrogen and phosphorus are very important, um, but so is the pH and the soil structure, right? So is it hard soil, loose soil, you know, lots of clay, kind of the, comp the components of the soil. So these are kind of all those inorganic uh, nutrients that are really important, especially for our producers or our photosynthetic organisms. But then that indirectly affects the uh, consumers as well that are gonna be eating those um, producers, right? So we do have some other factors as well. So what, how much oxygen is in the water? So dissolved oxygen in the water, which is very important. So whether it's, you know, flowing water or standing water, things like that. Um, and then you also have areas that have a lot of wind or a lot of fire, and that can really affect 
um, the soil and the producers, those photosynthetic organisms, as well as all of the um, consumers as well, right? So if you burn up all the producers, you no longer have that energy source for the consumers. So again, these are um, these are kind of, you know, more extreme factors, but there are certain environments that are always windy, right, or are in extreme fire danger areas. So they just have fires often, right? And so the environment has to uh, deal with those um, factors. So what types of things can affect our biosphere, right? So especially when we're talking about temperature um, and maybe rainfall and things like that. So this is going to be as well as our energy and sunlight. So we have two different things that a lot of people may think are similar and they are, but they're, they're distinct as well. And that's climate versus weather. Okay. So climate, has to do with long-term patterns of weather in a particular region. And so this has to do with the curvature of the earth, right? So the curvature of the earth causes an uneven distribution of solar energy. So sunlight is going to hit the earth um, in different regions differently, right? So certain areas it's gonna get a lot more sunlight and other areas it's gonna get a lot less sunlight. And so that's going to really affect that solar energy that we talked about uh, for our producers, right? But it's also going to affect temperature as well. And when we're talking about weather, we're talking more about kind of seasons, right? So seasons are just created um, by the Earth orbiting on the axis around the sun. So there is a permanent tilt to the Earth, and that kind of has to do with that climate. And then it orbits around the sun. So depending on uh, where you are around the sun, whether you're closer to the sun or further away from the sun, you're going to get that seasonal change, and that's going to change the temperature, um, the solar energy, as well as probably precipitation or rainfall, right? So climate versus seasons, right? So climate, think long-term, seasons, think, you know, changing patterns, right? So when we talk about climate, uh, we're not only talking about um, the curvature and the tilt of the earth and the amount of um, sun energy or solar energy we're getting, but we also have to talk about the oceans, the mountains, and the continents because they play a very vital role in climate. So ocean currents are what are going to moderate coastal climates. Okay, so they're what are going to affect those coastal climates, but they're going to keep them relatively consistent. And then as you um, increase in elevation, that's going to affect the temperatures. So the temperatures are going to drop um, as you um, get higher. Okay, and so that's going to affect uh, the rainfall and cause um, the moisture uh, to condense and cause precipitation um, as you increase in elevation. Um, and then the mountains are really what are going to modify those rainfall patterns because that's where the elevation is, right? So if you think about, um, say, the Sierra Nevada range, there's going to be moisture coming up from that Pacific Ocean, um, which creates that moist climate on one side, right, as that um, as that moisture rises, it's going to condense with that cooler air, and then that's going to cause precipitation. So that's going to be the moist climate um, on the Pacific side of the mountain range. And then as you come over the top of the mountain, um, it's going to actually absorb uh, the water and you're going to have this kind of dry side of the mountain and they call that the rain shadow. And so it leaves this kind of dry air on the other side and you get more of a, a desert like area or region, right? Um, think of the Mojave Desert, right? On the other side of the Sierra Nevada. So. Um, 
then you that's where you get your different biomes right in these different uh, regions so that's what we'll talk about in a minute So first we'll talk about um, aquatic biomes, but what is a biome, right? So it's a large area with similar environmental conditions. And then those organisms are gonna have adapted to those conditions. And so that's what a biome is, okay? So think environmental conditions that are similar and those organisms within those um, conditions. So in aquatic biomes, when we're talking about photosynthetic organisms, we call them phytoplankton. So think of our um, algae, our protists, the seaweed, right? So these are um, all these different uh, photosynthetic organisms, okay? Also in aquatic biomes, we see these smaller animals, these smaller drifter organisms that are consumers because they do consume other organisms. Usually they consume the phytoplankton and we call these consumers the zooplankton. So these are the actual animals that are consuming um, the producers or those phytoplankton. So we have phytoplankton, the producers, and zooplankton, which is the consumer. So the first type of aquatic biome we'll talk about is an estuary. And so this occurs where fresh water um, meets the ocean. So that could be from a stream or a river of fresh water, and it's going to meet the salty ocean. And so the salt concentra concentrations can vary uh, depending on the estuary, it just depends on the mix between uh, the ocean water and the fresh water. And this is really a very productive um, aquatic biome. So you see a lot of different types of organisms um, in this biome. So a great example that we just have pretty much in our backyard is the Santa Clara River estuary. And McGrath State Beach in Oxnard is part of that estuary. So you see um, oysters, crabs, fish, you know, nesting birds, all kinds of um, animals and organisms within this biome. So our second type of aquatic biome is a wetlands or our wetlands. And so these are transitional areas between aquatic ecosystems, whether you're talking about marine or saltwater or fresh water and a terrestrial ecosystem. So these are considered uh, mud flats, uh, salt marshes. Uh, those are usually what they're called. Um, and these are coastal saltwater wetlands bordering those estuaries. So where the estuaries are, that's where the actual fresh water meets the ocean water. But then surrounding that or bordering those estuaries is where we find these wetlands. So these mud flats and saltwater marshes um, are these coastal wetlands, okay, that we see kind of around in our area. And we actually have a very important salt, salt marsh, the Carpinteria salt marsh, and it's actually one of the largest and most ecologically important um, coastal estuaries or wetlands in California, which is kind of cool that it's in our backyard. So I posted this um, link for you guys if you're if you're interested in uh, visiting the Carpinteria Salt Marsh. You can uh, walk around. Obviously, it's a protected area, but um, it's very cool that it's in our backyard. So we see more of the salt water marshes um, in our area, but there are freshwater uh, wetlands as well. So those are kind of the saltwater wetlands um, around the estuaries, but now we also see these freshwater uh, wetlands as well, and they can be very rich uh, in their species diversity. And they can be very important ecologically because they can store water, uh, they reduce flooding and can even improve water quality, which is very important. 
So we have kind of three um, types of these freshwater wetlands that we see. Uh, there are marshes, right, where you see a lots of reeds and grasses growing uh, in the marsh. Um, and then there's swamps, right? So if you've ever gone to Louisiana or down in the south, um, there are lots of swamps and they're awesome. They're so cool. You can take a swamp tour and it's very fun. You feed the crocodiles or alligators, whatever live there. Uh, and there's woody plants and trees, right, coming out of the swamp. So kind of different from a marsh, right, in terms of the um, plant life. And then you see bogs as well. Uh, we don't have too many bogs over here, but some classic bogs are in Ireland. And they have these uh, what are called peat moss. Um, so they actually grow moss and then it um, ferments and essentially kind of petrifies in the soil. So the soil content isn't very good um, for like crops and stuff, but they actually harvest uh, that uh, peat moss and they use it as firewood our fire starter they, they burn it um, as an energy source which is kind of cool and it has a very uh, distinct smell if you've ever smelled burning uh, peat moss I really actually like the smell so those are bogs right um, and they've actually found a lot of preserved um, humans and things in the bogs in Ireland um, and have learned quite a lot about the early people that lived there so Anyways, I digress. So those are kind of our three different types of freshwater uh, wetlands, marshes, swamps, and bogs. So our last two types of aquatic biomes are going to be lakes and ponds. So those guys are going to be um, fresh water. They're usually um, a distance from the shore, right? Um, and they are standing water. Right? So still water, they're not running water versus our rivers and streams are also fresh water, but they're flowing water um, moving in one direction, right? So they're going to have different oxygen saturation content, kind of like we talked about er earlier with our um, abiotic uh, factors. So again, you're going to have things that live in there that are going to require different amounts of oxygen in the water, right? So you're going to have more um, oxygen in these rivers and streams because they're moving they're flowing versus our lakes and ponds are not going to have as much oxygen in the water so the sources for the streams and rivers could be um, snow melt right or a spring or even a lake and the nutrient level is really going to vary um, depending on the river and the stream and depending on the source of that water as well um, so just in our area, right, we have Lake Acetus up in Ojai. Um, obviously, it's not quite that full anymore. Um, and then we do have the Ventura River, right, that flows um, down into the ocean. So we have the Santa Clara, Santa Clara River as well. So lots of rivers uh, in our area. So now let's move on to terrestrial biomes. So we have kind of nine major terrestrial biomes and they're really defined by the plant life and also dominated by the plant life. So that means that the plant life kind of responds to the temperature and amount of precipitation will determine what kind of plant life is there. And then the um, the organisms and the animals and everything like that are going to kind of follow the plant life, right? Depending on um, where you are, or what temperature it is. And as you can kind of see from the map here, this is a very classic um, terrestrial biome map around uh, the equator showing kind of the different uh, temperatures. You know, obviously it's going to be a little hotter around the equator and you can kind of move your way outward towards the poles to get a little bit colder and colder. And so that is all going to be kind of determined by the tilt of the earth and all of the um, solar radiation, right? Um, uh, changing that temperature and climate, as well as uh, the rainfall too. And that is determined a little bit more um, by the uh, geographic of the geographics of the location, like mountains and things like that as well for the precipitation. 
So here's a really good uh, map or table as well showing um, kind of the differences between the temperature and the rainfall and what kind of biomes are found in that area. So if you look on the y-axis we see temperature. So you have low temperature, really cold at the top, and then you have higher temperatures or really hot um, at the bottom. And then depending on the precipitation on the x-axis, right, so how much rainfall do we get. So if it's very low, you're going to be um, on the left hand side. And if you're very high, you're going to be on the right hand side. So of course, you get, you know, the two extremes where you get high temperature, high precipitation, that's going to be our tropical rainforest versus our very low precipitation and very hot temperature, you're going to get your hot desert. And there's kind of everything in between. And so that's what we will talk about these different biomes. So our first uh, biome we'll talk about, or terrestrial biome we'll talk about, is the tropical rainforest. So for all of these biomes, I give you guys kind of a little graph up on the right-hand side to kind of show you um, the temperature versus the precipitation. Um, it's just kind of, you know, don't pay attention too much of the numbers. It just gives you a little bit of a scale in terms of how much um, in comparison to one another. So this, these guys are usually near the equator, right? So we said that it's very warm near the equator and we get uh, quite a lot of precipitation. So they get about 100 inches of rain a year. So that's quite a lot of rain. But the other thing is, too, is at the equator, they have very long days, so lots of sunshine, right? So lots of that solar energy for those producers. So we really get lots and lots of vegetation because not only are they getting a lot of water, but they're also getting a lot of sunshine as well. So what kind of animals follow all of the plants in the tropical rainforest? Well, because we have so many plants, we have a lot of trees trying to reach up for that sunshine. So we have a lot of arboreal animals, meaning they live in the trees. So we have lots of animals, but most of them really live in the trees. And so this is a very high biodiversity area because there's a lot of vegetation a lot of producers so we have a lot of consumers that are um, eating those producers right so even though our tropical rainforests um, really only cover about six percent of the earth we actually find about 50 percent of our species uh, in the tropical forest so that is a very high biodiversity and it's the highest um, of all of our biomes so really we get a lot of different wildlife um, and animals in the tropical rainforest but if I had asked you guys that you probably could have guessed that right our tropical rainforests are are very rich very vegetative and so that really gives rise to a lot of animals which is great so our second terrestrial biome is going to be the savanna so we have still the warm temperatures, but quite a lot less uh, rainfall than our tropical forest. So we only have about 12 to 20 inches per year. And so that really gives rise to fires. And so fires are really going to clear out all of those producers, those plants. So we really see grasslands because grasses can really recover from fire a lot faster um, than trees and things like that. So you have scattered trees, but mostly grassland. And so with the grassland, we're bringing in quite a lot of um, impressive grazing animals, right? So herd animals, grazing animals that are going to feed off of those grasslands. And so that with those grazing animals, we're going to bring in quite a lot of large predators, right? So we see a lot of large cats uh, in the savanna, right? And another big thing about the savanna, because of the lower precipitation, you see migration. So they're going to migrate to water sources and food sources, just depending on, you know, the fires in the area and the vegetation and the rainfall. 
So fire is very crucial in this area uh, because it does determine kind of their migration patterns, the grasses, the scattered trees and things like that. So fire is uh, very crucial and very important in the savanna. So our third terrestrial biome is the desert. So this is obviously kind of the driest of all the biomes. So very low precipitation, only about 12 inches a year. Um, and not all deserts are super hot. So we do have cooler temperatures um, in some of our deserts, especially at night. Uh, those temperatures can really drop. So you kind of have some extreme uh, temperatures in uh, our deserts. So you kind of have high deserts and low deserts and things like that. So we find them usually at our 30 degree north and south latitudes. So that's kind of a certain, a set distance away from our equator. But also we see them on the opposite sides of the big mountain ranges as well. Those rain shadows we talked about earlier, where you lose a lot of the precipitation on the, you know, ocean side of the mountains and then you get dry and hot on that rain shadow side of the mountain on the other side of the mountain so uh, we do see a lot of uh, deserts on the dry the dry sides the rain shadows of major mountain ranges so that's where we find these deserts so what kinds of plants and animals do we find in the desert well, we do find some vegetation in some animals, but they are very well adapted uh, to live in these kind of extreme environments. So if you notice, you know, all of the succulents and the cactus that live in the desert, they're highly adapted for water conservation. And so when they do get a lot of water, um, you know, random storms and things, they take advantage of that. So you do see kind of these annual wildflowers, these, um, you know, massive blooms. We've seen that out in here in California. And so they kind of take advantage of some of these uh, storms because they don't often see a lot of rain at once. So that's kind of cool. But the big thing about um, our area and across the um, U.S. and things like that, we do see some what's called desertification. So essentially you're converting some of these um, semi-arid regions to uh, desert. So they weren't uh, normally desert, but due to either massive droughts like we're seeing here in California, deforestation, or even inappropriate agriculture, you do see this kind of converting into a desert, and we call that desertification. And it's a huge environmental problem because you're losing um, a lot of the plants and animals that are normally in those kind of semi-arid regions, and you're turning it into a desert, which is a lot more um, a lot more challenging for the plants and animals to survive unless they're very well adapted, like in the normal deserts, right? So deserts are uh, very cool. You see a lot of very interesting wildlife um, and plants in those areas that are very highly adapted. So our fourth terrestrial biome is called chaparral. And if you notice, that could be in our backyard, right? So we live in a chaparral biome. Um, it's also termed a Mediterranean biome because you do see um, this type of biome around the Mediterranean. So this we find um, in kind of coastal regions that are bordering deserts, right? So we get maybe a little more precipitation than the desert um, and maybe not quite as hot. Right. So we do get, you know, you can have up to 30 inches a year of rainfall and they usually come in the cool, wet winters. But of course, nowadays we are seeing droughts, which we're not seeing our precipitation like we normally do. Um, so we are seeing uh, more fires, but fires are uh, relatively important in the Chaparral region and are quite common. 
So because of those very hot, dry summers, uh, that can lead to uh, fires, right? So the vegetation that we see in this area are quite drought resistant, right? So they have to be able to survive through these hot, dry summers. And so you see kind of small shrubs, um, small trees, such as our oak trees that you don't really see anywhere else in, except in the chaparral. Uh, and so and the leaves are quite waxy to really help um, uh, keep the water and moisture in the plant. So uh, chaparral is, is a very distinct uh, biome and only found in very uh, small areas of the world. So we're uh, kind of uh, special that we live in a chaparral out here uh, in Southern California area. So just like I was saying, it's kind of a rare biome. So if we look at our map here down at the bottom left, we really only see very certain areas of the world that have a chaparral, but you see the majority is kind of in the Mediterranean region, which is why it's also called a Mediterranean biome. But out here in California, kind of, you know, Southern California and Northern Baja, uh, we do see the chaparral. And naturally, we do get, um, you know, lightning fires, summer fires, which are common. But of course, nowadays, uh, we're seeing more fires due to electrical wires and things like that um, that are causing more and more problems um, these days. But, you know, plants around these areas are really adapted to natural fires. So we do recover very well from fires because they are um, used to having natural fires as well. And really, we only uh, see this uh, biome in a couple regions of the world, like I said. But because it's so rare, we also have what are called biological hotspots, meaning that we have some um, endemic species. So that means that there are some species that live in the chaparral that you don't see anywhere else in the world. So they're quite rare, meaning that they need the chaparral uh, biome to survive. And so we do see some of these um, endemic species um, in our area and in the chaparral. So we call that a biological hotspot meaning that that's kind of um, special because it's a rare biome and so you see some of these rare endemic species in that area. And so you kind of want to protect uh, those areas as well. So our next biome is the grassland. So this could be very similar to the savanna, but a little bit different because we don't see um, as many trees. So it's really treeless except along kind of the water sources, so rivers or streams. And we do see cooler winters as well. So not quite as hot. Um, about the same uh, rainfall maybe as you would see in the savanna, uh, maybe a little bit more, uh, but kind of a bigger range. Uh, and But fires are also very important in this area too, and so the plants are well adapted. So just like the savanna and the chaparral, we do see quite a lot of fires in the grassland, but those plants are very well adapted and can recover very quickly because we have mostly grasses, which are very well adapted to fires. And the soil is really rich in these areas because of these grasses. And so you see a lot of agriculture in these areas, a lot of towns um, around the agriculture. So this is really kind of think, uh, you know, the Midwest of the US is um, a lot of grassland area. So you do have these different prairies uh, in these areas, kind of short grass prairies, tall grass prairies, but the, but the big thing is that the soil is very rich in these areas. So our next biome are the temperate deciduous forests. So trees are deciduous. And what does that mean? That means that they drop their leaves uh, seasonally, right? So they lose their leaves in the winter. So these guys are very cold in the winter, right? So you get a lot of snow, but they're very hot in the summer. So 
quite extreme environments. Um, and so if you see our little map, we have about the same temperature as we do precipitation. So similar to the tropical forest, um, but a lot less um, in the precipitation and a lot cooler than the uh, rainforest as well. So you do get quite a lot of rain, right? 30 to 60 inches a year, but not as much as the uh, rainforest, right? Up at 100. So during the winter, the thing is, is that um, you get uh, snow instead of liquid water, right? So it's quite cold, you get a lot of snow, and so the, the trees uh, lose their leaves to preserve um, the health of the tree and they don't uh, freeze, right? So that's the deciduous forest. And temperate just means that the temperature is a little more uh, middle of the road, right? It's not super hot like the rainforest. And so because you have all of this leaf debris, the falling leaves, you get this kind of leaf litter right on the floor on the grounds of the forest and so you have a lot of decomposers and small animals that are taking advantage of this kind of leaf litter you know all the little uh, grubs and things that live in that leaf litter so because of these smaller animals and critters living in the leaf litter that brings in some predators as well, but not the big predators like we see in the savanna. So you see kind of bobcats, foxes, smaller bears, mountain lions, things like that that um, are a little bit uh, smaller, but they are predators um, for those kind of smaller animals li living in the in the leaf litter. But you do see some a lot of birds, right? So there are some arboreal animals as well, but not as many um, mammals, <clears throat> arboreal mammals, as we do see in the rainforest, right? So this is really, think, kind of our eastern uh, US, right? So out in the East Coast, we see a lot of temperate deciduous forests. So there are a lot of forests out there, right? So we have lots of different forests. So we just talked about our temperate deciduous forests. Now we have coniferous forests. Those, so these guys have our evergreen cone bearing trees or the conifers. So these are really our pine trees, um, things like that that have you know pine cones, pine needles, um, our conifers. So remember we talked about our conifers when we were talking about our different plants. So we do have kind of a northern coniferous forest called taiga or boreal is probably the more common term for the boreal forest. And so these are really a little colder, um, kind of more north, right? So um, these guys are very cold compared to the coniferous forests are still quite cold, but not quite as cold as the boreal forest. So we do see some pre precipitation, right? But not quite as much as those deciduous forests. Um, we do see kind of a temperate rainforest as well in certain regions, kind of our west coast, kind of Oregon to Alaska. These guys are also coniferous. So lots of different types of coniferous forests out there. So you can kind of look them up and see. But again, think kind of our, you know, northern uh, regions, northern west coast regions. So our coniferous forests have very long cold winters, right? So quite cold, obviously um, the boreal forest is even colder, um, but then you have these kind of short wet summers. So they, that's where they see their uh, precipitation is in the summer, which is kind of different from um, us, which sees the, the, the wet and the precipitation in the winter. So the trees, these coniferous trees, kind of really help um, uh, to shed the ice off of the pine needles and off of the tree itself. But because we have so many coniferous trees out there, this is also where we get a lot of logging, right? Heavily logged regions in the coniferous forest. So our next biome is the tundra, and the tundra is quite an interesting area. Essentially think of it like a frozen desert. 
So the temperatures are very low and the precipitation is very low and um, it really has a lot of um, very freezing cold permafrost. So there's really kind of this lack of liquid water. And so the permafrost is a continuously frozen subsoil. So the soil is always frozen. So you get this very um, frozen environment and you don't see a lot of um, plants no deep rooted plants, very few vegetation, um, even very few animals. And the animals that are there, just like our deserts, are very adapted to the environment. And so you see kind of the tundra in the Arctic regions before the polar ice regions. So before you get all the way um, to the extreme poles, you see the tundra. And so we really get very little rainfall, right? Less than 10 inches a year. And uh, there's a very short <clears throat> growing season for the little bit of uh, vegetation that is there. So the marshes, when they're not um, frozen, support kind of the larva of insects. So you do see some insects. But again, you really don't get a lot of um, plant or animal life in the tundra area. So our last biome is the polar ice. So this is the north and south pole, essentially, right? In the northern hemispheres, you're really, um, it covers the land that's north of the tundra as well as all the ocean. And in the southern hemisphere, you're talking about the polar ice covering Antarctica as well as the ocean uh, in that area as well. So very similar uh, north to south, but you see some differences in the animals um, in the two, between the two north and south hemispheres. You do get some plants, some small plants like mosses and lichens. Um, you do get some small invertebrates, right? Nematodes, mites, things like that. Um, but this is really where you actually do see an increase in kind of the marine life. So because we have this kind of polar ice covering the ocean, it actually heats the ocean up underneath and keeps it from freezing. So you actually do see quite a lot of marine life, such as seals and polar bears and penguins, a lot of marine birds as well, because um, there is uh, quite a bit of life in this area, even though you wouldn't think um, that there would be, that polar ice actually helps um, to um, make the environment a little more hospitable for the animals in that area uh, versus the tundra can be even uh, more extreme, I think, than the polar ice areas. So we see even lower temperatures, though, um, in the polar ice than the tundra, but about the same kind of precipitation. So that's it. Those are all of the biomes that we'll talk about. And there are some kind of smaller biomes or kind of in between some of these that I don't want you to worry about too much. I just want you to worry about the ones that we talked about. And so I have a table for you guys this week to work on to kind of review all of these different terrestrial biomes, kind of the similarities and differences, what kind of plants and animals you find there, what kind of temperatures and precipitation you see in those areas. So it's going to help you kind of distinguish between the different regions and biomes for the upcoming exam for the next unit. So if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you guys later.